<clears throat> okay, so hello to everyone and uh, welcome to the Cultural Memory Seminar hosted by the Institute of Modern Languages Research within the Center for the Study of Cultural Memory. My name is Guido Bartolini. I am a visiting fellow of the IMLR as well as a postdoctoral researcher in Italian studies at University College Cork, where I work on the cultural memory of Italian fascism. So um, the event uh, that you have joined, I mean, is actually comprised as a whole four seminars, which have the aims to um, explore the role that cultural products play in the um, dissemination, formation and discussion of a sense of responsibility for past atrocities. The idea for this seminar series came um, from the fact that in the last two decades, the acknowledgement of past wrongdoings has become a more and more common feature of the memory cultures of many societies across the world. This means that probably today, much more than ever before, there is lots of research going on on the representation of past wrongdoings, on the history of perpetrators, as well on uh, the investigation of the various cultural strategies that present society uh, use to establish a relationship with a burdensome history of injustice. Yet, a lot of this research takes place within different, different disciplines. So there are somehow di mm, disciplinary boundaries and linguistic and cultural restraints uh, that separate research going on on uh, themes that are uh, similar. And indeed, I mean, these uh, research seminars, these cycle of seminars would like to create a space to go beyond these boundaries and to um, allow scholars who are working in area studies in different cultural and linguistic traditions to come together and to enter in dialogue with historians as well as scholars of memory studies. Indeed, the, the idea behind the seminar is that uh, no matter the differences in the topics that we <laughs> investigate, uh, when we address the legacy of the past, and this can uh, be about the history of genocide, of dictatorship, of war, of colonialism, there are, no matter the differences, there are common elements and the common questions that we all address. And so I think that we can all uh, learn um, from each other, I mean, by discovering, you know, and listening to what uh, colleagues in different disciplines are actually doing. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome the three uh, great scholars that uh, uh, we are lucky to listen uh, today, uh, who are Professor Max Silverman, Professor Hanna Meretoya, and Professor Donald Bloxham. Um, so, sadly enough, I must say, I mean, I think we are all kind of used now, we start at least to be used to online events. So this is not a novelty anymore, but it's become a common element of our daily life. But so I will just remind you the few basic uh, rules. So obviously keep your microphone muted during the, the presentations. So each speaker is going to talk for 15 minutes and then there will be a Q&A at the end. You can uh, ask your, your question uh, by raising your digital hand. And so this is an option that you find in the participants button. So if you look at the bar <laughs> down below, you click on first on participants and then you raise your hand. It will allow you to um, ask a question on screen. Otherwise, if you don't want to, to, to talk in front of everyone, uh, you can always use the chat. So we can, you, you can use the chat throughout the event to write comments or questions and we will monitor it throughout and then pose the question to the speakers. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, even ask a question anonymously. So just write to me, Guido Bartolini in the chat, and then I will ask the question to the speakers. I must uh, remind you that the event is recorded and is going to appear on the MLR website in the next uh, days. So if you don't want to be recording and to appear in the video, uh, just keep the video off and use the chat to, to in, uh, interact 
with us. Uh, so I just have to uh, stress, I mean, that the event, I mean, received financial support from uh, Hari, the Humanities and Arts Research Institute of Royal Holloway University of uh, London. And, uh, mm, and of course, from uh, University Council of Modern Languages. <laughs> okay, so uh, having saying that, we, I think we can, uh, uh, start, I mean, the, the Mediated Memories of Responsibility seminar uh, by introducing uh, the first speaker, who is uh, Professor Max Silverman, uh, who is uh, a Professor of French Studies at University of Leeds, and he has worked on uh, post-Holocaust culture, post-colonial theory, and questions of trauma, memory, race, and violence. He's the author of Palimpsestic Memory, the Holocaust and Colonialism in French and Francophone Fiction and Film. And in the last 10 years, he has edited together with Griselda Pollock four books on the theme of the concentrationary, the concentration, concentrationary in cinema, concentrationary memory, concentrationary imageries, and concentrationary art. The title of his talk today is Impure Memory. Thank you, Guido. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, is that yes. right? Of course, please. Can everyone see that? Yes, it works fine, perfect. Okay, good. Well, thank you for that introduction. And um, uh, thank you for all of those who are attending as well. Um, not that I can see you, but um, I know that there are some people out there. So I'm not just speaking to a blank screen. I think I think my name is coming up as Nina Bihal uh, on your screens. That's my wife's name, actually. It's not my uh, my alias. Um, so that uh, just to sort out any confusion. Anyway, uh, Guido tells us we have 15 minutes to um, to deliver our presentation. So uh, I will. Uh, what I'm going to do then in my 15 minutes is to uh, divide it into two parts. I'll say a few words about, first of all, I'm going to say a few words about two Lebanese films. And in the second part, I'm going to make some brief and general uh, theoretical remarks. So uh, hopefully fairly uh, simple uh, structure. This is the title of my talk. It's, uh, it's uh, Impure Memory. Um, if I just move on to my second slide, if I can, doesn't seem to be moving. Whoop. Mm, yeah, try to perhaps just click or press the yeah, arrow. I am. Uh, if, if you I play, don't... if you if you press ask, perhaps first. Yeah. yeah, if you read the problem, then you can just share it. Yeah, okay. People can see that then, can you? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. All right, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so my first example then, <clears throat> um, I'm going to refer to a single, uh, a single scene in a film that I have previously written about called Je veux voir, uh, I want to see, by the Lebanese filmmakers Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jorge, made in 2008, which, uh, as you can see from this, uh, from this image, pairs uh, Catherine Deneuve, uh, the icon of French cinema, with the Lebanese actor and performance artist Rabi Mroué. Now, in the scene in question that you can see there, the two visit the destroyed house of Rabi's grandmother in a village south of Beirut. The whole village has been uh, turned to rubble following the bombing uh, campaign of the Israeli army during the summer of 2006, so that uh, Rabi uh, can't even locate his grandmother's street or house. This is where he spent part of his childhood, but as he says, I don't recognize anything. Je ne reconnais rien. However, what is clearly a moment of extreme personal anguish for Rabi 
as he's confronted with the visible signs of destruction born of conflict, is transformed into something else, as it is refracted through the gaze of Deneuve and through the lens of the camera filming the screen. Filming the, uh, filming the scene, sorry. Seeing, feeling, and remembering a split between the two characters and the spectator, hence decentering the gaze of viewer and viewed, and decentering memory, transforming both into a hybrid and entangled process. Whose memory is this? What history is conjured up here, and how is the viewer implicated? The film stages these as questions, but does not provide easy answers. If I just go on to the second of my uh, examples, this is another, another Lebanese film called In This House, made by Akram Zatari in 2005, which blends documentary and fiction, personal stories and history. The storyline uh, is as follows. At the time of the Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon in 1982, Christian residents of the villages east of Saida, where Zatari himself grew up, were forced to flee. When the Israelis withdrew in 1985, some of the houses in these villages were occupied by Lebanese and Palestinian resistance fighters, as this was the new front line. In 1991, with the signing of the TEF Agreement, which brought an end to the Lebanese civil war, resistance groups were disarmed and the original residents were allowed to return to their villages. One of the resistance fighters was Ali Hashisho, who you can see here uh, in one, on one side of this, uh, this screenshot. <clears throat> he was a radical socialist at the time, and now in 2002, when Zatari interviews him, he's a photojournalist. Ali explains how he felt an ethical responsibility to the displaced owners of the house that he had occupied to explain his presence in their home. So on leaving the house, he wrote a letter to the owners saying that he and his fellow fighters had tried their best to protect and preserve the house, and then placed the letter in an empty bomb capsule and buried it in the garden for posterity. So the main part of the film is then Zatari's attempt to relocate the time capsule by digging in the spot in the garden where Ali said he buried it. And on the other side of the screen there, you can see uh, the person who's digging the hole looking for the time capsule. <coughs> Now, just this brief description uh, already hints at the multiple entanglements at work here. The original residents of the house are never visible, as they don't want to be filmed, but are nevertheless always present and appear, so to speak, as characters, as they are the addressees of the hidden letter written by Ali and placed in the bomb capsule. Their presence is overlaid by the personal story of Ali, who lived in the house for a number of years, the history of the location involving the Israeli invasion and the resistance to it, and the biography of Zatari himself, as he grew up not far from these hills, and is here both extra diegetic filmmaker and intra diegetic actor in the film that he is making. Not to mention the identifications, projections, and affective responses of the viewer. As with the scene in Je Vevoir, the film doesn't simply involve the reappearance of something buried in the past, as the capsule, capsule and the hidden letter inside it are indeed eventually unearthed. But not the reappearance, but rather the appearance of a complex story through the connections uh, and encounters established in the filmic present. In this sense, digging is both a literal and metaphorical activity in that the physical act of unearthing entails the construction of personal and historical knowledges. The story of the house is therefore a project, the film project, 
not a given. Many of the connections established during the project are unpredicted, unscripted and spontaneous and add new layers to understanding. For example, in order to dig in this site, Zatari has to get the permission of the authorities, which is only granted on condition that no faces are shown during the digging process, except that of the gardener, who was the main digger. You can see him here, although you can't see his face. Uh, as the dig progresses, the army contacts Zatari to tell him that one of their personnel needs to be present while the digging is carried out. Eventually, police and army arrive, tell him to stop digging, and then relent and say he can only continue if no photos are taken. So this unscripted development, like uh, a number of others, introduces an additional layer to the complex question of the connections between place, history, memory and power, showing subtly and critically the role of state power and censorship in the production or suppression of information. The process of revealing a complex and multi-layered reality beneath the surface is especially performed through Zatari's trademark techniques as filmmaker. Split screens showing a juxtaposition of different images, as you can see in the screenshot here. Off-screen sound, often at odds with the visible images, non-synchronous editing and so on, creating a sensual and conceptual layering of image and sound and hence of space, time, identity and memory. What is this space? What are its temporal dimensions? What is its affective presence? What are its power dimensions? What is its history and who has the right to speak about it? All these questions are raised in the course of the filmic process, but as with Je veux voir, there are no clear answers as there is no closure. In the second part of the talk, as I uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, I want to make three brief and general remarks, drawing on the two examples that I've just given. First, by staging encounters between different times, places, cultures, histories and voices, art, uh, I would suggest, can do what political, religious, legal and even historical discourses uh, find difficult to do, that is, establish an ambivalent poetics of memory that runs counter to what is, at worst, reductive and often dogmatic orthodoxies. The impurity of memory of this model, in which traces of one are always to be found in the other, denies the homogeneity of collective shared memory on which national, ethnic, or other identitarian models of memory are based. Impure memory poses a challenge to the competitive and invidious memory wars between different groups by casting doubt on the correspondence between memory and the ethno-cultural identity of the group and the communitarian or national politics that accompanies it. Uh, in previous work, uh, as Guido mentioned, uh, I have used the figure of the palimpsest to define this model of memory, whose invocation of the invisible presence of traces of former texts or images that haunt the visible surface denies the purity of memory. Palimpsestic montages put in play a non-dualistic poetics of similarity and difference that in subverting the clear distinctions of linear time and rationalized space, pro proposes a different politics of memory in relation to moments of extreme violence that is reducible neither to local, national, or ethnocultural differences, nor a universalist vision of the same. This superimposition of different spatio-temporal traces at the heart of the palimpsest resembles Gilles Deleuze's description of the time image in film as the coexistence of layers of the past. 
Michael Rothberg, Debati Sanyal and I have named such hybrid constellations ne de mémoire or knots, knots of memory to distinguish them from Pierre Nora's more monolinear lieu de mémoire or sites of memory. The second point I want to make is how this model is premised on the idea of memory as a creative act of assemblage, that is, a performative act in the present, rather than simply the retrieval of forgotten moments in the past. The past moment or buried history, the village in Je veux voir, the letter in, in this house, is never retrieved and recollected in any clear sense, as it is always constructed, mediated, and fictionalized through numerous forms in the present and acted out affectively by present actors, including the spectator, to the extent that we're not even sure whose memory is at stake. These are not reenactments that bring to light hidden truths as in the archaeological method of classical Freudian psychoanalysis, but enactments or dramatizations or performative acts in which something happens in the filmic present. Film does something performatively rather than simply shows something. And the third and final point I want to make, uh, which relates more directly to the theme of memory and responsibility, given that that is the, uh, the title of, uh, <laughs> of Guido's series, is that conceiving memory as both impure and a performative act establishes multiple intersectional and often contradictory encounters, which refuse to conform to the oppositional categories of perpetrators and victims, and guilt and innocence. In other words, reading memory across rather than within temporal, national, and ethno-cultural boundaries suggests that complicity, responsibility, and justice cannot simply be conceived through these categories, through these terms. Impure memory means questioning the apportioning of blame to others elsewhere, while we identify and empathize with the victim. Moreover, is it the task of art to prescribe subject positions and pass judgment as in a court of law? Often when art does do that, it's not very good art. Of course, this is part of a much broader question concerning art, politics and uh, ethics. In brief though, uh, I am, uh, as you can probably uh, work out by now, uh, skeptical about uh, cultural memory, even art in general, as an arbiter of responsibility for acts of extreme violence. My feeling is that the staging of encounters with the past in the present opens up questions about responsibility and justice, not only intradiegetically, but also in relation to the viewer or reader without providing closure. Let us remember Jacques Rancière's comments on the emancipation of the spectator by the creation of dissensus in art and a consequent redistribution of uh, le sensible, the sensible or sense, rather than art as the transmission of fully formed political messages. This is a sentiment that uh, Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jorej certainly ascribe to with regard to post-Civil War film and photography in Lebanon, and I suspect Akram Zatari would too. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, thanks a lot, Max. Thank you. Of course, I mean, yeah, if if this was a in-person event, I mean, we 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 would all, uh, as Donald suggested, I mean, clap the, the hands, but we can actually do it perhaps later on. But so th thanks a lot. I mean, because already just for the the series of questions, I mean, that you posed at the end, I think this could be the basis of 
an amazing I mean, conversation that, however, will follow in a bit, because now instead is uh, the time, I mean, to uh, welcome our second speaker, who is Professor Anna Meretoia, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at University of Turku in Finland, where she's also the director of SELMA, the Center for the Study of Storytelling, Experienciality and Memory. Professor Meritoya has been visiting fellow at the University of Oxford and Royal Holloway University of London. Her monographs include The Ethics of Storytelling, Narrative Hermeneutics, History and the Possible, and The Narrative Turn in Fiction and Theory, The Crisis and Return to Storytelling from Rob Grier to Tournier. Together with Colin Davies, she has also edited The Routledge Companion to Literature and Trauma, and the book Storytelling and Ethics. The title of her talk today is Non-Subsumptive, sorry, not subsumptive memory, and Jenny Erpenbach's Gehen ging gegangen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the inv invitation and good afternoon, everyone. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you fine, yes. Yeah, good. So uh, in this talk, I will discuss what I call uh, non-subsumptive memory. And in the end, I will briefly put this theoretical model in dialogue with Jenny Erpenbeck's novel. So my starting point is that memory plays a crucial role in our processes of sense making. We encounter a new situation from a horizon of understanding shaped by our earlier experiences, but our memory, however, is never entirely our own. It is mediated by cultural models of sense-making that can be called cultural memorial forms. Often these cultural models have a narrative dimension. They draw meaningful connections between experiences and events in time. Practices of memory as resources for understanding are not merely cognitive, but are entangled with affects and have ethical and political implications. I use the notion of understanding here in the broad phenomenological hermeneutic sense. It is a mode of orienting ourselves in the world, a form of relationality that involves an affective relationship with the past. I focus here on memory as a mode of understanding others. A crucial question, both epistemologically and ethically, is how to evaluate when does memory contribute to ethically sustainable understanding and when does it lead to violent appropriation of the other. In philosophy, understanding has been most often conceptualized in terms of subsuming something singular under something general, and as a general concept, uh, something general such as a general concept, law or model. In the continental tradition, however, Nietzsche has powerfully argued that understanding is inherently violent because it makes the singular, uh, it, it masks singularity of things. And I, I try to share my screen now. Okay. Um, so Nietzsche writes, every concept comes into being by making equivalent that which is non-equivalent. He, uh, he uses the leaves of a tree as an example. So every leaf is different, but the concept leaf makes us forget the differences between them. And similarly, the concept of a woman, for example, can be used to homogenize women and to impose a problematic gender binary on human beings. For similar reasons, Levinas argues, uh, 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 Levinas equates comprehending with englobing and appropriating, and Derrida writes about the originary violence of language or archiviolence. Archi it is possible, however, to argue that there are also non-subsumptive, non-appropriative dialogical modes of understanding. We can think of understanding as um, 
fundamentally as a fundamentally temporal process that follows the structure of the hermeneutic circle. When we encounter something new in the world, we draw on our pre-understanding, shaped by our earlier experiences. But instead of the unfamiliar being simply subsumed under the familiar, the new experience can shape, modify, and transform our preconceptions. Understanding have to perpetuate dominant sense-making models. In genuine understanding, the, the new has potential to transform the general. The singular, the particular, has potential to transform the general. This, however, requires non-subsumptive dialogical ethos, uh, openness to the otherness of the other, and a willingness to let, let it challenge our preconceptions. In my book, The Ethics of Storytelling, I propose a distinction between what I call subsumptive narrative practices that reinforce culturally dominant stereotypical narratives and non-subsumptive narrative practices that challenge such categories of appropriation. This is a spectrum rather than a dichotomy, and these concepts are meant as heuristic tools in the ethical evaluation of different narrative practices. I would now like to expand on this idea and propose a model of non-subsumptive memory. While memory has been traditionally uh, understood as a process of retrieving aspects of the past, recent memory studies um, has emphasized the dynamic, pro productive and performative nature of memory. Remembering is an activity, something that we do in the present. It makes something present for particular purposes and uh, thereby, makes, uh, th thereby takes part in shaping current cultural reality. Through practices of memory, we make sense of the past, but the activity takes place from the horizon of the present and serves as a way of orienting ourselves uh, to the future. Paul Ricoeur emphasizes this future-oriented aspect of memory when he writes about our duty to remember, which consists not only in having a deep connection for the past, deep concern for the past, but in reflection on how we may prevent the same events from recurring in the future. Recent memory studies has discussed this issue in terms of collective responsibility. In evaluating the ethical and uh, political potential of memory for the present and future, it is useful to look at how processes of memory as uh, practices of sense-making can be placed on a continuum from subsumptive to non-subsumptive. There are different ways of using narratives of past experience as models for sense-making uh, when we encounter new experiences. Memory follows the logic of subsumption when it is reified into a fixed memorial form under which a new event our experience is subsumed. In such act of subsumption, the new phenomenon is taken to be the same as something of which we have a memory of, or which we are familiar through uh, cultural narratives, for example. Culturally dominant narratives of Nazi Germany or East Germany, for example, function as such sense-making models when developments in Trump's America are equated with the rise of fascism in 1930s Europe or when surveillance of dissidents in contemporary Turkey or Hungary is equated with Stasi uh, terror. As Michael Rothberg puts it, comparison is unavoidable because we cannot not attempt to understand our local situation, whatever it is, without reference to global historical developments in a, in a variety of other national contexts. But such comparison can be done uh, without losing sight of the historical specificity of the compared events. Stop sharing for a while. Uh, so uh, memory serves understanding uh, non-subsumptively when we use our earlier experiences as a starting point for understanding something new, but without thereby subsuming the new under what we remember and understand from the past. It is characterized by a dialogical ethos, a willingness to change one's understanding, both of past events in light of what one knows now, 
and of current events in light of one's understanding of the past. So it is open in both directions. However, there can be no purely subsumptive or non-subsumptive memory. And in practice, processes of memory combine subsumptive and non-subsumptive elements in different ways. The meaning of the Holocaust or East Germany, for example, is shaped in a process of negotiation, contest and debate that involves a dynamic of subsumptive and non-subsumptive acts and in which attempts at subsumption can be reframed in a non-subsumptive way. And I will now turn to uh, Jenny Erpenbach's novel Gen ging gegangen in English go went gone from 2015. So it appeared in the height of the 2015 migrant, so-called migrant crisis, uh, but it is based on the occupation of Iranian plots a couple of years earlier, a protest by African refugees um, against German asylum politics. The novel's protagonist is a retired professor of classics, Richard, who has an East German past and in the narrative present gets to know African re refugees who are looking for asylum in Berlin. Erben Beck's novel deals with the relationality of memory by showing how we relate the new to what we are familiar with. For Richard, cultural narratives of the Holocaust and both personal and cultural narratives, uh, cultural memories of East Germany function as memorial forms that he uses in the attempt to relate to the situation of the refugees and to make sense of the German response to it. These templates both enable understanding and prevent it. In distinguishing between productive and problematic uses of memorial forms, it is helpful to evaluate whether they function subsumptively or non-subsumptively. So in trying to engage with the refugees' experiences of exile, Richard's East German past both enables, helps him to see certain things, but also blinds him to others. In the beginning, the narrator draws attention to what the protagonist does not perceive. For example, he does not hear the silence on Alexander Platz, despite the magnitude of this silence produced by the asylum um, seekers. And um, I have a quote here. Uh, the silence of these men who would rather die than reveal their identity unites with the waiting of all these others who want their questions answered to produce a great silence in the middle of the square called Alexanderplatz in Berlin. Why is it that Richard walking past all these black and white people sitting and standing that afternoon doesn't hear this silence? He's thinking of Rezzo. So uh, Richard... Um, relates the system of cellars under the Alexanderplatz to the labyrinth of tunnels under the Polish city, Rezzo, Jews hid in both uh, during the Nazi years, just like in Rezzo, he thinks. This act of subsumption, which involves seeing a sameness between the two, stops him from seeing what is going on on the square, uh, in the open, in plain sight. Uh, it is often the moment when Richard thinks that he understands, when he takes this or that to be exactly the same as something that he knows from another context, that he is led astray. In contrast, it is humility, humility linked to um, admitting his ignorance and the curiosity of wanting to know more that lead him to understanding something new. In these productive instances, however, he also draws on his past particularly on those aspects of his life that involved an experience of being lost, disoriented and estranged, an experience of becoming a stranger, not only to others, but also to himself. A similar experience of disruption is crucial to the life stories of the refugees. From one day to the next, our former life, uh, oh, sorry, it's uh, another slide. Okay. Um, so from one day to the next, our former life came to an end. Our life was cut off from us that night as if with a knife. So um, um, a key, key question that the novel explores is how to find shared points of reference without subsuming the other. 
under one's own expectations uh, and preconceptions. One necessarily has a certain pre-understanding, but what is crucial is the ability to revise it. First, Richard makes sense of the refugees' life stories through the categories he's most familiar with, uh, and even uh, renames the refugees uh, after heroes of the Western mythological and literary canon, such as Apollo and Tristan. But eventually, he gets better at dialogical listening and is able to let his preconceptions change. The novel focuses on the uh, conditions of possibility of a genuine encounter in which something ethically valuable can happen. That is an openness and willingness to learn as conditions for a dialogical encounter in which presuppositions become challenged and categories of understanding transformed. The more Richard learns about the refugees, the better he is able to see the limits of his earlier categories. And the better he listens, the more he learns. Hence, openness is a precondition for new understanding. But the process of learning from others also helps him to become more open and undogmatic. So to conclude, non-subsumptive memory is driven by curiosity and openness, by a desire to engage with the other in ways that entail exposing oneself to the other and a willingness to let go of one's own certainties. It displays an orientation towards the other that is characterized by a mode of dialogical exploration. Elbenbeck's novel as a whole conveys such a non-subsumptive ethos. It is, it, its narrative style emphasizes the open-ended, tentative and preliminary nature of its narrative endeavor. Its narration shows how closed, fixed, Subsumptive narratives tend to be linked to a form of memory that is less productive in terms of creating conditions for genuine understanding than narrative memorial forms that invite dialogical, explorative engagement. Non-subsumptive practices of memory function in the explorative mode. Rather than assert and explain, they open up new horizons for asking questions. So I suggest that a non-subsumptive model of understanding can be helpful in theorizing memory as a mode of sense-making that can contribute to understanding histories of violence in responsible, ethically sustainable ways. In general, mnemonic sense-making models tend to be productive when they adapt and change as they are applied to new situations and harmful when they subsume new experiences under a fixed meaning template. In the non-subsumptive mode, cultural memory has potential to function as a resource for understanding a resource for learning in other oriented processes of dialogical understanding. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Anna, for this deep talk, which connects extremely well with what we listened before from Max. But again, this is something we will discuss in a bit. Uh, so now uh, to move to our third uh, speaker, I'm uh, extremely uh, I'm delighted. I mean, yes, to, to, to welcome Professor Donald Bloxham who holds the Richard Peart Professorship of History at the University of Edinburgh. He had written widely on the Holocaust and genocide, and his books include The Great Game of Genocide, Imperialism, Nationalism, and the Destruction of the Ottoman Armenians, and Genocide on Trial, War Crimes Trials, and the Formation of Holocaust, History, and Memory. In the last several years, uh, Professor Bloxham has been working on four related books, on the history and theory of history. And two of them have appeared already uh, with Oxford University Press, Why History, a History, and History and Morality. I must say that I'm very glad that Professor Bloxham is here to speak today as I developed some of the ideas that uh, led to the creation of uh, the Mediated Memories of Responsibility seminar series after reading parts of his book, The Final Solution, A Genocide. So the title of his talk today is Beyond Neutrality, Historianship, and Moral Judgment. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, we do. Great. Well, um, I haven't got much time, so I'll get to it quickly. But thanks very much for having me. It's really very nice to be here, you know. And hello to everybody who's, uh, who's uh, watching or listening. Um, I don't know how revelatory this will be to an audience that I suspect is preeminently from literary studies and the world of literature and cultural studies, but 
I think it might be a bit of a wake up call to historians. So imagine I was speaking to some of them as well. Here we go. Um, the famous French historian Marc Bloch uh, once declared that the historian's uh, sole duty is to understand, not pass judgment. For Bloch, judgment was akin to a chemist preposterously separating the bad gases like chlorine from the good ones like oxygen. More recently, the historian Richard Evans wrote, the historian's job is to explain, it is for others to judge. As with philosopher Michael Oakeshott's ban on treating the past as, I quote, a field in which we exercise our moral and political opinions, like whippets in a meadow on a Sunday afternoon, value judgments seem to have the bad odor of, uh, of uh, advocacy or propaganda. Uh, conversely, I would argue that where it matters, it's actually impossible to remove value judgments from historical accounts. We need to think about the quality and, and nature of these judgments, not the admissibility of them. In the explanation of human affairs, rather than in Bloch's chemistry lab, accounts of how and why something happened may be inextricable from accounts of responsibility and the existence or otherwise of justification. In the explanation of the First World War and so much else, just as in detective novels, the question who done it is at once a question about cause and guilt. Assuming that we have negative attitudes to that which is caused, as in the First World War, Establishing causal responsibility can also be identical to praising, as often when we talk about peacemakers. Take revolutions, surely some of history's most contested battlegrounds. When we talk of revolution, um, we often contemplate the weight of revolutionary grievances, the regime's willingness to address grievances, the proportionality of grievances, the violence of revolutionary action, the nature of revolutionary action to secure the goals of the revolution, and so on. Such ruminations are laden with concerns about costs and benefit to people and society. And while ideas of acceptable costs vary along with ideas of what constitutes a benefit, that only means that judgments relating to those ideas will vary, not that all judgments can be removed. It's certainly easy to caricature, caricature historical evaluations, and some indeed deserve caricature. Um, it was the medievalist David Knowles who wrote in caricaturing mode, the historian, the historian is not a judge, far less a hanging judge. Of course, moral evaluation need not be thus. It can be understated, qualified or implicit, and obviously positive as well as negative. Furthermore, rather than summarily occurring at the end of the account as if a jury were pronouncing, evaluative elements can infuse historical accounts throughout. The language historians necessarily use to characterize acts, motives, policies, social arrangements, and so on, is often evocative, reflecting or pr prompting evaluative reaction. Words like theft, uncharitable, corrupt, brave, generous, deceitful, venal, kind, or racist, at once describe, evoke, and evaluate. To describe some text as anti-Semitic is to convey its attitude towards Jews, but no one stands neutral to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites anti included, of course. The key analytical question is whether a historian is substantiated in using any given word of this sort, not whether its use implies or evokes judgment. Much as the question in a causal account is not whether it implies praise or blame, but whether it has good evidential warrant. At the other end of the scale from word choices, a work of history gives an overall impression. I can think of no better way to put it than this because the quality and nature of these overall impressions varies greatly. I suppose we're talking about the level of the total narrative, if you like, the total explanation. This impression can be a product of the explicit argument, as say when a historian of the British Empire sets out to marshal evidence in support of the case that the imperial project was after all driven by good intentions rather than selfishness. Or the overall impression can be a product of accumulated descriptions and explanations of historical outcomes, causes, intentions, experiences, and so forth. Now I'll return to this impression because it's, it's important as I bring my talk to a close later on. What I hear you ask about the argument that the past is a foreign country where they do things differently. Well, historian Herbert Butterfield famously inveighing against moral judgment, wrote that, and I quote, historical explaining does not condemn, neither does it excuse. 
is neither more nor less than the process of seeing things in their context, unquote. Context is, of course, the key word here uh, and a central disciplinary concern, also one of the slipperiest expressions in the whole of the historian's lexicon. Nevertheless, grasp of different circumstances and ways of life is one of the historian's chief, uh, chief virtues, I think, uh, and supposedly a guard against anachronism. All that varies with context, however, is the content of standards, i.e. the sorts of things deemed praiseworthy or blameworthy, not the existence of standards. The common refrain about taking historical actors on their own terms is actually imbued with the moral philosophy. Let's call it moral contextualism. The logic of the moral contextualist position is that one judges in accordance with the appropriate standards of the time. It's not that one does not judge full stop including that power, for instance, was wielded, wielded illegitimately or legitimately according to the standards of a past time, is just to imply a judgment relative to those standards. Once I understand different, different social expectations and values, I'm equipped and entitled to use the descriptive come evaluative word cowardly to describe the Homeric Greek warrior who shies from battle and the senior academic today who fails to defend a junior colleague against a bullying line manager. One implication of moral contextualism is that it would be bizarre to criticize people in the past for acting in accordance with their own value system. How pointless to tell the deaf and dead that they should have had different standards to the one they had. Well, I agree, but that's, there's much more to be said to it than that. Whether we're looking, we looking at bygone worlds or at the diverse world of today, our evaluations are not just linked to motives and justifications, but to outcomes, including harmful or helpful effects on other people. A key distinction needs to be made between the idea of measuring past people against a standard that they may not have held and evaluative reflection on the past practices and the values mandating those practices. This distinction comes into particular relief when we consider that in the past as now, standards could be contested and the relatively powerful were in a position to affect the lives of others who did not share their standards of what was good or legitimate. Take slavery. Contemplation of, of what slavery involved may or may not affect our conclusions about some commodities broker who made a fortune on the back of slave labor. I suspect it would, but conceptually that's a separate issue from the, the conclusion about our, that pertain to our evaluations of slavery as such. Yeah? Evaluations as to the motives uh, and and thought processes of that commodities broker are separate to our conceptual evaluation of the very practice of slavery as such. It's manifestations in death, torture, sexual abuse, day-to-day -day humiliation, exploitation, and the racism legitimating those things. The idea of evaluating practices and values in foreign countries past raises the question of moral relativism. But this turns out to be a non-problem. One form of relativism often known as normative moral relativism, goes on to say that it is wrong to judge the values of other groups. This is a flawed self-undermining argument. It proposes a group transcending universal moral standard about the wrongness of judging against group, across group boundaries while denying the existence of such group transcending moral standards. There are much more strong, much stronger and more effective uh, relativist arguments a uh, principle amongst which is uh, meta-ethical uh, relativism. The, 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 the main relevant claim for current present purposes of which is that there is no way of objectively establishing the superiority of one moral system over others. Whatever the great strengths of this sort of relativ relativism, it is irrelevant here. It is not itself a claim about what is right or wrong. It does not constitute a case against judging across, against, across the boundaries of foreign countries. It would only deny that such judgments would have any compelling basis for those whose practice and relevant value is being judged. Yeah, so it doesn't constitute a case against judging across the boundaries of foreign countries. And that is just as well because some such judgments can be unavoidable. Well, let's hypothesize a scenario to illustrate how that might be unavoidable. Say that in my research, I encounter some practice from the dim distant past that seems to bring happiness or suffering to some members of a past society. 
my re immediate reaction is to think how pleasant or un unpleasant that practice seems. Anyone who tells me that I ought not have that initial gut reaction is whistling in the wind. Perhaps I should not progress from the gut reaction to any further thought that might shape a more careful judgment. In that case, my understanding will not be furthered by contextualization of the foreign practice, comprehension of its social function or the attitudes of various parties to it. My gut reaction will remain unadulterated, which seems unfortunate. Perhaps I'm permitted the further thought process, but not any final evaluation. That does not work either. Even without some formal verdict, it will be impossible to ignore the way in which the greater understanding reversed, negated, diluted, or reinforced my gut reaction. Judgment is already upon me. The question then is what I convey to my audience, which returns us to what to aforementioned matters of content, and especially what I called the overall moral impression provided by historical work. It's where we come back to the idea of the overall moral impression, or the overall narrative level, if you like, would be the best way of translating such a concept into the the idiom of um, uh, literary criticism. That overall impression is the product of a unique composition that goes well beyond the terms, their own terms of causal of historical causal agents. And it goes beyond much more besides. Historians re routinely go behind the outlooks of historical players, contextualizing in ways that may not have been familiar to them and introducing a voice external to the scenario under examination. Historians, if we just take a very easy example, a bit of a cheap example, really, historians of Hitler, for instance, um, do not just reproduce, far less adopt the views expressed in Mein Kampf. Rather, they explain what personal experiences and cultural tendencies led Hitler to hold these views. Equally, as historians explain the significance of, or consequences of what agents did, they may harness the pe perspectives of people affected by those actions or provide their own externalized description of deeds. Think how strange it would be to, to see, in inverted commas, Stalin's attacks on so-called kulaks solely through Stalin's eyes. There is no reason that other perspectives should cohere with the outlook of the causal agents. Consider again the different views and experiences of slaves and slaveholders. If historians' own accounts of actions and effects do reflect the values of the agents, that actually tells us more about the historians than anything about proper historical procedure. Different comp compositions may give relative emphasis to this or that element or exclude certain elements altogether, but the result will simply be to create differing moral impressions, not, no, not to create no such impressions. It is no good historians washing their hands and saying readers can make up their own mind about the moral aspects of the tale as if unprompted. Historians need to take responsibility for their prompts their choices of words, examples, perspectives, and so on, which means, in the first instance, acknowledging that they are providing prompts. Now, the last thing I'll say in conclusion, I think I've got about two minutes left, um, is to say that, is to try and bring this up to the current, the present, or the most difficult situations in which this, these sort of reflections might apply. Uh, think about the nexus of history and identity. And I suppose this is where we get to the memory question. I won't deal with memory directly, but issues of identity relative, re relevant to memory. Some historical evaluations, while intrinsically no more and, and I suppose no less political than others, have particular political ramifications because of the assumed relationship between the past and the present. Here, I think the rubber hits the road. And I'm, I suppose I'm thinking of that large subset of areas where we write about elements of the past that are seen somehow to have a connection to the present. We might think of the word historicism, a very tricky word with all sorts of different meanings, as in one sense connoting historical consciousness of difference in the past, separateness, you know, the past as a foreign country, uh, but also in some sense also related to the word historicity, the sense that one's identity or one group's identity is partly historically shaped. Uh, and in the latter connection, we move away from sort of the sense of relativism with its concepts of distancing, to the sense of, of relatives, literally in the sense of, of family, some, some kind of sort of extended family, uh, the sense of ancestors to whom we have some sort of quasi familial relationship. And of course, throughout our society, uh, the latter focus is promoted, uh, well, you know, in British society and many other societies, because British society, as in many other societies, are disposed to find sources of pride in the past. Pride is encouraged in the case of Britain with its obsession with parts of the past. <clears throat> this is obviously not a value neutral obsession. 
that is suffused with our judgments about good and bad, right and wrong. The memory of the ancestors, or a select bunch of them at any rate, is supposed to be revered. Those who advocate pride or applause are not then in a permission to dismiss, position to dismiss shame, dismay or anger about the past as category errors. The pride advocates have implicitly rejected historical neutrality and a relativistic attitude to the past. So on pain of inconsistency, their disagreements with shame advocates and so on are really about the criteria and content of judgment, not the propriety of judgment. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Donald. I mean, yes, for what is definitely a thought-provoking uh, speech. I mean, that I hope, I mean, it will uh, help to fuel the conversation. I mean, and, and thanks also for uh, having done everything to respect the time. I mean, thanks, very, very, very appreciated. All right, okay, so we can, uh, we have listened to three different, but I think very connected, I mean, presentations. And uh, uh, as a chair, I mean, I'm, I can, always begin, I mean, the conversation, but I can also wait and see if someone would like to already ask something. So as I said, please remember, I mean, you can raise your well, hand. We have some, we have some questions already in the chat. Yes. And um, that have been coming, that have been coming in. Yes, Selena, please, please. So you. Um, I'm sure you've had your hands full with trying to get everything else. Um, Sorted. So the very first question that we came in actually came in from a, a colleague who has a Russian name in a Russian in Cyrillic script, or well, else a name in a Cyrillic script that I can't read. Um, so I'm very sorry, but I have the question here, um, which is a question from Max, um, asking how does the idea of impure memory correspond to the idea of agonistic memory by Anna Gentobul and Hans Hansen? You're muted, uh, Max, you're muted. Am I unmuted now? No. I am, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I must say uh, I'm not totally familiar with agonistic, uh, what was it, agonistic memory? Um, but um, in terms of my understanding of the word anyway rather than how it's been how it's been formulated uh i would say that there yes there are there are connections um um they're, they're more it, it, it's more in terms of i think uh, some of the things that i was saying does uh link up with what Hannah was uh, was saying as well in terms of um, uh, um, a, a connections connections between things that necessarily uh, create uh, create a, 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 a dissensus and what uh, Hannah is calling uh, non subsumptive non subsumptive forms of uh, of uh, of, of understanding um, and so um, uh, agonistic then in in if if it relates to that sort of that sort of uh, that sort of approach then um, then yes and Kate just very helpfully put in the chat that the person who asked that question is actually called Andrei Linchenko so thank you very much for transliterating that on my uh, for me um, we have some other questions. Guido, do you want me to go to the other questions we've had come in so far? Yes, please, please, if you... So we actually have had questions come in for each of the speakers so far. So the next question, I think we'll just go in order, um, was from Jenny Watson um, for Hannah, um, a question about the um, Eprenbeck book. Um, and she asks how the reader knows that Richard is making a mistake in his use of subsumptive comparisons. Does the text rely on reader knowledge to know that the comparisons are inappropriate or unhelpful? Or are there also narrative gestures that underline these efforts as doomed to failure? <coughs> uh, and then she asks perhaps a link to Max's discussion of the implicated audience. So quite a, quite a, quite a long and dense question from, from Jenny, um, but that's, that's a question for Hannah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, in the Erpenbeck novel, um, it relies quite a lot on um, kind of narrative 
irony. So there's a lot of irony from, from the side of the narrator that um, sort of creates a distance uh, to the protagonist. Uh, for example, uh, the narrator tells the reader um, how, how the protagonist, Richard, um, expects certain kind of response when he helps the refugees. He expects that the, uh, one of the refugees that he should uh, show gratefulness in certain ways, um, do this and that. And then, then uh, the narrator just um, states that uh, nothing of the sort happens. So, so the uh, so the Richard has certain expectations and they are not met. But um, in part, I think it's exactly as you suggest that they relies on on uh, on the reader reader's knowledge. But on the other hand, also on a kind of ignorance that probably the readers share with Richard. So in a way, uh, it's about encountering something very different. So these African refugees come from a different from different cultural contexts. And um, and the kind of embarrassing situations to which which uh, Richard in which Richard finds himself are the kind of situations where the reader might also find him or herself. Uh, so it's a kind of the kind of learning process, learning by mistake in a way, uh, is something that the reader can kind of follow and and probably relate to as well. Um, so it's more like um, the mistakes are become evident uh, when we see how the the refugees um, experience things very differently than the protagonist expects, for example. And then the more we learn about the refugees, uh, the more we understand this uh, discrepancy, but also uh, the possibility of dialogue, which is very kind of um, kind of step by step and, and, and subtle. It's not like some kind of complete um, transformation, but, but there is still this subtle process of learning going on. Uh, and yes, I think there is a connection to to, to Max's idea of um, implicated audiences, uh, but but maybe also kind of um, I think it's possible to read it so that there are uh, different implicated audiences, mainly the Western um, educated uh, readers. But um, I think it would probably make sense also uh, from for readers from different other cultural context. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Thank you, thank you, Hannah. Um, I'm not sure if Max wants to come in and he's welcome to say anything or we have a, a number of questions coming in. I do wanna make sure that we get a chance to get to them, to as many of them as possible. Um, so if everyone's okay with it, I might move on to our next uh, our next question, which is uh, uh, usefully for, uh, for Donald so he doesn't feel uh, left out, he wouldn't want that. Um, this is from Peter Davies. Um, what is the relationship between emotional reactions and evaluative judgments? Uh, the doggedness of scholarly arguments about supposedly objective disciplinary standards shows us that there is no emotion-free judgment, even if we claim to have left behind our initial gut reaction, as you put it. Ooh, um, uh, can you hear me? That's Yeah, great. So, well, uh, a couple of different things have sort of thrown together there, which I would wish to extricate. I mean, I don't think my initial gut reaction is necessarily an emotional one so, so much as a pre or unreflective one. Um, I mean, it's clear that there's a difference between an initial reaction and a reflective reaction. Whether that maps onto the distinction between an emotional judgment and a moral judgment is a separate question and not one which I'm immediately interested in. So it's, um, however, there is, you know, there clearly is a role. Um, um, I mean, emotional judgments can clearly be a stimulus to further moral judgments. Moral judgments may have a significant element of emotion within them. I think the, po the point I'm trying to make here is about the inevitability of judgment, not about the um, objective nature of that judgment when it's found. Uh, like with all these things, it will come down to a matter of moral reasoning with admixtures of emotion, very possibly, yes. Although I'm not really thinking about objective planes of anything. I mean, I, I think I, in the abstract, I'm a, I'm a meta-ethical relativist at the whole level, just that in practical life, um, those arguments make very little difference because you can't, you know, act in the abstract when you're engaged in specific encounters. 
Um, so, so yeah, that that would be it, Pete. By the way, is that you, Peter, from South, from Edinburgh? If it is, hello. The downside of Zoom is that we have a good chance to actually see people. Yes, it's Peter, me. Hey, Pete, how are you going? All right. It's like bringing friends together. It's like Tinder on Zoom. Um, we actually have a related question, Donald, um, from Ruta that's just come in, uh, which I might put to you immediately because I think it's related to the previous question from Peter. Um, how, do you, how do evaluative judgments relate to the concept of historical empathy in this discussion? Um, and she says she's thinking of historical empathy as both cognitive and affective in this context. Well, very good question, really. I mean, as, as the last one, really, you know, these really get to the heart of some of the matters. Well, I, it's difficult because there's always a question of who you're empathising with. And, 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 you know, I think really the, co yeah, but thinking about the cognitive and the affective thing, and again, it would be, they are separate things. And I think it would be a deconstructionist fallacy to say that while they may join each other or not be entirely distinct, to say that there's no distinction whatsoever. There clearly is a pra pragmatic distinction that we always use between the affective and the, and the, and the cognitive. And that's, that's especially <laughs> in light of, um, you know, I mean, empathy when it was first used by, I, you know, in the 19th century by guys like Wilhelm Dilte and so on. It is, and um, this was really a kind of, a very specifically a cognitive thing, um, even with Herder, I think, is, you know, much more cognitive than, you know, it's latterly with the rise of identity politics and so on, that it starts to become a more effective thing. Um, when you're dealing, for instance, with the, got into a bit of an argument in, in Holocaust study circles when talking about writing about perpetrators. I mean, that where there still abounds the idea that if you write about, you know, at the, at, the at the distilled level, the allegation was basically, if you write about perpetrators, you're somehow writing through the eyes of perpetrators, which seems to be a category mistake. Um, but it's forwarded by this misconception that, you know, some sort of cognitive empathy must be equivalent to aff affective empathy. Um, at, as someone pointed out to me a long time ago, if you're if you're going to be an effective torturer or an effective boxer, you've probably got to have quite a good empathetic understanding of the person opposite you. You know, there's no necessary warmth to the process. There's no necessary positive quantum of you know. So, and I think that would be quite a useful image to carry along if you ever find yourself working on Holocaust perpetrators. So. But it's, it's precisely because I think that this is why I talk about the kind of the historical composition, this sense that when we write histories, even if we're focusing directly on, you know, why did perpetrator X commit awful, appalling crime? Why? We're never just, you know, the understanding of the internal volition of that perpetrator, their own internal justifications, worldview standards is only one part uh, of a variable size and a much larger picture that we're putting together. You have to get behind them. So why do they come to have those beliefs? You know, what? subconscious structures, economic, social, are, are acting on them to create that set of beliefs, you know, so that's even getting behind behind their subjectivity in a way that at, at that level, at that very, very narrow level, you can say that it's possible to know someone else better than they know themselves. <laughs> Only at that level, right, of the historical context of them. Um, and then you go on to look about possibly incorporating the, the, the sub, you know, the, the outlook of people who are on the receiving end of persecution, the outlook of people who are onlookers to this, the subsequent knock-on effects of particular acts of persecution and crimes, and all of those are expanding the whole lens and expanding the complexity of this historian's entire product far, far beyond the initial subjectivity of the causal agent. And in that sense, so 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 for all of those reasons, the um, the question of of, of empathy. You know, is important, but it needs to be leavened in all of those different ways and kind of weighed against all those other things. Thank you, Donald. And um, we have some more questions coming in, so I think we're just going to move directly to those, Guido. If that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some of them are related to some of the points that you were just making, um, uh, Donald. Then one is for um, for Max from Elena Cardona. Um, asking about impure memory um, and asking, is impure memory experienced by both the victims and the perpetrators? What do you exactly understand by impure memory? Does impure memory also refer to the fabricated memories and events by governments about genocides and atrocities? So it feels like I think there's also something that probably many of you might be able to, uh, to answer there. I don't know if Max wants to 
take that first. Uh, I, I'm talking about uh, a, 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 about any any form of memory, which uh, uh, whether it's from wh whoever's point of view it, it is from, whether it's a government uh, that's seeking to justify itself or a perpetrator uh, narrative, uh, I'm I'm seeking to undo the uh, the homogeneity of that of that narrative, that that narrative is not. Uh, can't be considered in in uh, simplistic and reductive reductive terms. So it's not so much a question of who's who's making the narrative. It's more a question of of how one treats narrative itself. Um, and um, the the point that I was trying to make at, at the end of my talk about uh, about the, uh, the the distinction perhaps that needs to be made between art. Um, and other forms which are which are uh, which are also narratives and making judgments all the time is that art has different different tools at its disposal to actually problematize the homogeneity of narratives and to create uh, doubts and ambivalences when in fact uh, uh, single lines of argument seem to be uh, seem to be the norm. So even when even when uh, narratives are constructed that actually are uh, or seem to be um, ploughing a particular a particular single furrow, it's not necessarily the critic's uh, task to simply adopt that, um, uh, or even or even the the reader or spectators. There are different ways in which that that relationship can actually uh, unpick the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the unity and the homogeneity of of uh, of that narrative. So, so um, the idea of uh, of an impure memory is also is also uh, is also one that that simply can't be reduced. Can't be reduced to a single line of uh, to a single line of argument, or even, or even a sort of uh, a multiple line of argument, actually, because in fact it, it's always an entangled line of argument, uh, rather than rather than anything that can be simplistically deciphered. Um, I don't know whether that actually responds. I think I've got off the point a bit, but uh, but anyway, that's. Uh, that's uh, that's where I got to. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, we have questions coming in uh, thick and fast, as you can see on the chat, I think. Um, we have one for um, Hannah, which I'd like to go to. Um, asking, uh, Jenny Watson's asking you to expand a bit on the cultural memory uh, forms of sense making. Um, she asks, how independently do the affective elements of these structures operate? Do you have to know the history of the GDR to feel what it was like, she asks. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess um, in the novel, uh, you can see how the sort of individual, personal and the collective or cultural aspect of memory uh, intersect in, uh, in, in the case of each individual's memory and depending on their personal history, um, I guess the affective aspect has different sort of shapes and maybe intensities depending on how uh, personal, uh, whether it's, it's personal memory or something that's picked up from, through me, sort of mediated through, um, uh, through media and representations or from one generation to the next. So, uh, so I think um, there are probably um, differences uh, but I guess the, also the in, sort of inherited memory can also be quite affective uh, uh, or have this strong affective um, component depending on, I don't know if you can really generalize um, necessarily, uh, but in the case, uh, in, the, in the novel, um, it's evident that this personal history of the protagonist uh, linked to uh, East Germany um, is kind of entangled to the mediated uh, memories of of the Nazi 
parts of Germany. So, so there is probably um, a difference there that the personal experience of what it was like to live in uh, DDR um, has this very, it's, it's like linked to this whole spatial uh, aspect of, of what, what it's like to live and move, move around in Berlin. And then uh, the legacy of Holocaust in a way is this sort of, um, it, it, it places this sort of ethical uh, questions um, that sort of implicate everyone but they don't have this same sort of personal um, affective intensity linked to the personal memories. For example, the protagonist has this strong memory of how, um, how when they had to uh, flee East Germany, um, he was a little boy and he was left on the train, um, of, like by the train and the train was about to leave and his mother was already in the train and the so Russian soldiers lifted him and gave him uh, to his mother and that sort of act of solidarity in a way is one of these positive sort of memorial forms that he uses um, to sort of try to uh, envision a way that contemporary Germans could, could respond to people in need like the African refugees for example. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Hannah and um, I'm very conscious uh, Guido that we are um, rapidly running out of time and we have I'm, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to all of our questions but I think perhaps for the speakers if there's something specific there might you might be able to answer somebody specifically in the chat if there's something somebody's actually looking for um but there are two uh, questions that are quite similar one from Agad um, and Hussein and another from Natalie Thomas and I think we can kind of merge those and maybe use those and uh, ask each of the three speakers to respond to this because I think they're quite they're um they're both directed at Max but I actually think that all three of you um would have something to say, I think, about this. Um, really thinking about this tension between, on the one hand, the need to remember atrocities, for example, genocides, um, and this idea of taking responsibility, um, and how we balance that within, as, as uh, Akkad puts it, the pragmatic need to achieve social re reconciliation and peace, or as Natalie puts it, uh, the need to avoid conflicts between differing narratives of memory and different memory narratives. So how do we kind of uh, square that circle, essentially that, that core tension um, that I think is really at the at the centre of what this whole series is about. I hope I haven't garbled those two questions um, and you understand what, uh, what the, the, the participants are actually asking you to, uh, to address. Thinking about this tension between the need to remember and the need to achieve reconciliation briefly. Maybe I'll come first to Donald or to Max. Max, Donald, Hannah, I... Oh. I'd go on, Donald. Okay, go, oh, Don, no, let's please, go to Donald first then. I mean, I, I don't have anything profound to say. Um, <laughs> perhaps won't surprise you. I, I just, um, uh, I think, I mean, it's it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, uh, who, who who gets to decide which of those things ought to have priority? I mean, reconciliation is one of those nice words, isn't it? But under what under what terms? This just means those who have been um, repressed, uh, raped. Um, you know, had their families murdered, uh, plundered in the past, and that they just knuckle down for the sake of a bit of superficial peace uh, in the present. Well, yeah, I mean, reconciliation loses some of its veneer. Nonetheless, societies do have to have some sort of baseline of order, even if it's an order on what legitimate agreement, is, uh, legitimate disagreement is, in order to work. I mean, some of these matters um, are difficult for for. Um, for me as a historian, because you know, I think my first and foremost duty is to what I think of, of as the, the most best warranted inferences from evidence about the past and hang the consequences uh, in the present, uh, whilst knowing that there can be very, very significant consequences in the present. Um, it was difficult to know how, how to reconcile one's own sort of uh, professional ethos, um, even though I do think that ethos has to include judgment, Clearly, some judgments can be very incendiary and others not. Um, yeah, but I mean, reconciliation is not always, you know, everything hinges upon the terms of reconciliation, doesn't it? So, uh, reconciliation itself does not seem to me an intrinsic good. But then equally, you know, are, um, is memorialization an intrinsic good? Well, was it uh, Yero Shalmi who described justice as the opposite of forgetting rather than the opposite of um, injustice? Well, is that true? I just don't know. I just don't know. 
I just don't know. This is, yeah, sorry. Right. That's uh, it. Useless non-reflection. <laughs> well, uh, no, I thought that was uh, that was interesting, actually, Donald. But um, I, I, and, and if I could pick up uh, part of what you were saying um, in, in relation to, 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 to cultural memory, at least in cultural memory and the sorts of art forms, the sort of cultural works that uh, that I'm interested in, I don't think reconciliation is a prime concern. It doesn't mean to say that reconciliation can't come out of the creation of something that is actually the opposite of reconciliation. That is a sort of, uh, I mean, I quoted um, I quoted Jacques Rancière at, at the end and the creation of dissensus, um, which is sort of holding things in abeyance. It's actually not actually. Uh, tying up the loose ends. It's not actually closing them down in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, finding some sort of re reconciliation. Now that doesn't mean to say that it can't perform uh, a way of bringing about some form of reconciliation later uh, through um, through the spectators, readers actually having to reconsider having to reconsider orthodoxies, having to reconsider uh, uh, stereotypes, uh, set narratives, all of those things which actually often tend to keep people apart. And if they can do that, then, then reconciliation could be an after, an, uh, an after effect, if you like, um, just as various other things can, new ways of thinking. Uh, opening up various different possibilities for the way people interact. Um, but uh, I don't think that one, one would say, at least I wouldn't say, that reconciliation has to be a primary aim of how, uh, how you deal with uh, a cultural memory in order to uh, reduce uh, conflicting narratives. Um, shall I also say something? Or? Absolutely, Hannah. Okay. Uh, so um, I just think that they are not necessarily, um, they don't have to be conflicting aims that they need to remember and the need to create conditions for some kind of dialogue. Maybe I would rather talk about dialogue than reconciliation, but I guess they are close to each other. Um, so, um, for example, what art does quite well is provide different perspectives on the same events and that kind of awareness, uh, sort of perspective awareness, uh, for example, is quite important condition for, for dialogue, for the ability to perceive the things that we thought we knew how they are, to perceive them from a different perspective already creates this kind of um, um, questioning of our certainties uh, to which Max also referred. Um, so, so I think um, art can or has potential to sort of bring these uh, aims um, into a kind of balance um, and they don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive. Um, but I also think that the kind of questions that art raises are often more important than, than sort of providing some kind of conclusive narratives, for example. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all very much for those really rich answers, I think, to the questions. I think sums up a lot of what this seminar series is about. Uh, given that it is 1629 by my clock, um, or at least in London it is, um, I'm going to pass back over to Guido and I'm going to say I'm very sorry that we haven't managed quite to get to all of the questions. I have copied them into another document, so it may be that it's possible for um, the, the speakers to, to answer them in a different form. Um, but I'm very sorry we weren't able to get to, to everybody, but thank you all for uh, your great participation. I'm going to hand back over to uh, to Guido. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Celine. I mean, yeah, for managing brilliantly the many questions that came through through the chat. Uh, yes, I I think I mean we should all uh, thank the speakers. I mean for having been here. I mean and attended this session that I I I think I mean can uh, all. Uh, all all the things you have said, I mean, can inspire us. I mean, in pursuing, you know, our our research. I mean, even if this takes place in different, you know, uh, disciplinaries on different topics. But uh, and I hope, I mean, to be able, yes, to to continue the dialogue. I mean, with with you. I mean, because I really can see how 
all the ideas you have discussed can even you know connect to my personal research on uh, on Italian fascism. So please join me. I mean, in thank I mean everyone I mean to for having attended and at least I mean let's do, let's do a virtual I mean and quite awkward applause. I mean, but that's 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 what what we can do. I mean, yes, and uh, and so yeah, and I also I mean thank all the attendees, of course. I mean, and I just re remind everyone, I mean, that this is a cycle of seminars. And so we, we are going to meet again in, uh, in January and to, to continue, you know, the, the conversation. And I, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, that or ideas that already emerged here, they are going to, to continue, I mean, and uh, be part of the future seminars. I mean, so I just would like to thank everyone for having attended, I mean, the, the first session today. Thanks. Thanks a lot.